Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. A warm welcome to our service of morning worship from Christ Church. This is one of three services taking place today. There is also morning worship in the church and Messy Church in the hall. Messy Church are hearing all about the very scary storm and what Jesus did about that. The rest of us are remembering the Apostle Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas, 
But when he saw the risen Jesus, he uttered the most amazing statement of belief. We do have a few notices. Pensioners Praise will be meeting tomorrow at 2pm and Margaret Fowler will be continuing our series on caring for God's creation. I'm told she also has some photographs from Oberammergau. If you did sponsor Margaret, Jenny Chalk or Pauline Olden for their sponsored walk for the building fund, they're now after your money. So if you could let them have it as soon as possible, please. This week, our new church wardens, Jennifer Anderson and Chris Davis, were sworn in at a service at St Martin's Church in Basildon. Do please pray for them as they take up their office and give thanks for all that Val Shepherd, our outgoing church warden, has done in the last six years. And a notice from me. As most of you know, I was licensed as a licensed lay minister last weekend, which is why I'm wearing this cross. And I would just like to thank everyone for your messages, cards, flowers and gifts, and for your ongoing support and encouragement. Thank you so much. So now we come to our opening prayers. Please join with me in saying the words in bold. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, direct our thoughts. Teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we now come to our time of confession, when we look back over the last week and say sorry for anything that we have said or done or thought that we now regret. And we ask God's blessing on the week ahead. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have failed you, as did your first disciples. We ask for your mercy and your help. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins. Heal us by your Spirit and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now Stuart brings us our Bible readings, after which Pete Fisher will be speaking to us. Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 31, verses 1 to 6. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, Lord, my faithful God. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. As for me, I trust in the Lord. Today's New Testament reading is John 20 verses 24 to 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may these spoken words be true to the written word and lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There are only a couple of stories in the Gospel of John that mention Thomas. He's included in all the lists of the disciples in all of the Gospels and in Acts, but it's only John that gives him a voice. So I thought it would be helpful for us to look at all these stories and try to get some idea of what sort of person Thomas was. That might help us to understand why he doubted like he did. And then we will take a look at this morning's Bible verses and see what they mean for Thomas, and see what they mean perhaps as well for us. According to traditional accounts of the St. Thomas Christians of India, the Apostle Thomas landed in Musiris, that's near Kochi as far as I can work out, on the Kerala coast in southwestern India, and he arrived in about AD 52. He was martyred in Mylapore, near Madras, which is now called Chennai, in AD 72. A journey northeast across Tamil Nadu, covering something like 700 kilometers. That's about 430 miles. He founded the ancient Indian Christian churches on his journey. And that was a journey which, had it been recorded, would no doubt have rivalled Paul's journeys around the Mediterranean. Thomas's first specific mention is in John 11. Jesus tells his disciples he wants to go back to Judea, but they really aren't keen on the idea at all. But Rabbi, they say, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus tells them in a roundabout way that Lazarus is dead. And then, because they don't get it, he tells them straight out that Lazarus is dead. They would have known, of course, that Lazarus was one of Jesus' closest friends. So it's Thomas out of all of the group who responds, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now, as Catherine was saying last week, it's difficult for us to know how that was said and what he was really meant by what he was saying, because we don't have the tone of voice and we don't have the body language. But I can't help feel one way or another that it's quite a downbeat response. Despite that, it does also show that Thomas has a certain commitment to Jesus that perhaps the others at that point might not have had. Later, Peter will profess openly that he will follow Jesus anywhere and never leave him. And then, at the last minute, Peter, in fear of his life, fails to live up to that promise. Like Peter and the other disciples, Thomas will also abandon Jesus. But for now, Thomas is perhaps grudgingly, or perhaps with a degree of resignation, will actually follow him. Knowingly following someone, however much you love them and respect them, into a dangerous situation shows a certain strength of character. We have to go on another three chapters before we hear about Thomas again in chapter 14. Jesus is comforting his disciples, having just predicted Peter's denial. And Jesus says this, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. 
I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also will be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? One thing I like about Thomas is he's not afraid to ask the obvious question. I'll bet that all of the disciples were sitting there thinking pretty much the same thing. What is Jesus talking about? I don't understand. And they were probably all just waiting for Thomas. And it's Thomas who finally speaks up and asks the question. And we should be very glad that he did. Because Jesus' response is one of his most well-known sayings. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Without Thomas having been willing to speak up and ask his perhaps obvious question, we wouldn't have this wonderful quote that means so much to so many. Then we get to our reading this morning. That's the next time we hear something from Thomas. And shortly afterwards, Thomas is mentioned at the start of chapter 21, where the disciples decide to go back to their fishing boats to take up again their old careers. Our reading started with, Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Which prompts immediately two questions. Why not? And where was he? We can't answer the latter question, but we can speculate a little bit about the former, the why question. The disciples have watched as the man they thought was their Messiah, who would save them and restore Israel, was arrested, given an extremely unfair trial, and then put to death. They were in fear of their lives, believing that the authorities would come for them too, and that they would suffer the same fate. They have been in hiding and have been being very careful. They think it's all over, and in a few verses' time, we will read that they are going to go back to their old jobs. It's entirely reasonable to believe that Thomas was hit harder than perhaps the other disciples. It's possible he had excluded himself from their company for large amounts of time, and now only met with them on occasions. Perhaps he was contemplating leaving the group. After all, what's the point? The leader has gone. So when he meets up with them again, and they tell him, We have seen the Lord! He begins to think that perhaps they are delusional, or suffering at least from a severe case of wishful thinking. His answer, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's a very long-handed way of saying, but I want proof. Which sounds entirely reasonable to me. After all, dead men don't walk and talk, do they? So a week after this incident, Jesus appears while they are all together in a locked room. And this time Thomas is there too, and he's given his chance. Jesus says to him, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. It sounds a little harsh to me. Is Thomas really supposed to believe the others? while they are deep in their grief. After all, the mind plays strange tricks on people in that situation. I can remember a few instances of thinking I'd seen my dad in the first few weeks after he died. And I began to get quite annoyed that there are so many people who look like him. There weren't, of course. But that's what it does to you. 
But it is different for Thomas. However down he was feeling, firstly, he'd had years of teaching. Jesus had been teaching them for three years and almost all of that time he'd been teaching them about his death and his resurrection. Did none of it go in? Was he not listening? And secondly, he had been there, as we have already seen, when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. So he has seen a resurrection. There is enough teaching. There is enough evidence. Thomas should not be doubting. He should believe what the others are telling him. Just a short aside for a minute and then we'll come back to Thomas's situation. Belief in the resurrection is critical if you are to be called a Christian. A few weeks ago, when I was discussing the Trinity with you, I said that the Trinity was the distinctive belief in Christianity, the belief that makes Christianity different from all the other religions. And it is. There are lots of mythical religions that include the belief that their God has been resurrected. One such God is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 8, where Ezekiel is shown the detestable things that the Israelites are up to. Women are mourning for the god Tammuz. The exact beliefs about Tammuz vary with time and place, but now it appears that he spent half his time in our world, probably the summer, and half his time in the netherworld, probably in the winter. So he was mourned each year and resurrected six months later. So far as I can find, no one ever believed that Tammuz was a real man. So while resurrection is not a distinctive idea, having a real man resurrected seems to be. And it's God's proof that Jesus' mission did not fail. Without it, St Paul says, we are still all in our sins. There is plenty of evidence in the Gospel and some in Paul's letters that the resurrection really did occur. All the arguments of how a mistake might have occurred are covered. All of the conspiracy theories are covered. But the best evidence we see today is the change in the way the disciples behaved once they had fully understood that the resurrection really did happen. Anyway, so getting back to Thomas and the disciples. It's critical for the mission that Jesus has for his disciples that they are clear about the resurrection and are convinced that it's real. So Thomas is given the chance. Jesus effectively says, Go on then, examine the evidence. Everything you need to believe is here. But evidence is not what Thomas needs. He clearly already has enough of that. In the teaching he has received already, and in the things he has seen and experienced, and in the trust he has put in the other disciples. What Thomas needs is to see Jesus. We have the phrase, seeing is believing. Maybe it comes from this passage, I don't know, but if it doesn't, it certainly could. Now Thomas has seen the risen Lord. There is only one possible response. My Lord and my God. Thomas's doubting is over. He is restored. He is ready for the mission ahead, just as Peter was after Jesus reinstated him. There are a lot of artworks based around this scene. It fascinated the Grand Masters. Most of them, using their artistic license I suppose, got it wrong. 
the recognition in that passage is instant. Thomas makes no attempt to examine Jesus' wounds and certainly doesn't take up the invitation to stick his fingers in Jesus' body. It is Thomas' interaction with Jesus in this scene which gives us another one of the important quotes of Jesus that we all love so much. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Is this perhaps a prophecy for Thomas's ministry? For all those people in India who he would explain Jesus to and convert to the Christian faith? For all those people in the churches that he would establish? They would all be convinced that Jesus died and rose again. But it applies as much to us as it does to them. Because we have not seen, and yet we believe, so we are blessed. How many of you, I wonder, looked at the evidence for the resurrection when you were considering the Christian faith? I know I did. That was one of the things that I had to be sure was a distinct possibility before I was even going to entertain getting closer to Christianity. We have seen, though, that evidence alone is not what it takes to make people change their minds, to make people believe in something. Just think of the vaccination debate. The evidence for the use of vaccines is strong and the risks are low. But people still make up their minds based on what their friends say, whether those friends are qualified or not. I wonder how many of you were swayed by the evidence alone and gave your life to Christ solely on the basis that you now believed in the resurrection. A sensible thing to do, but not really, I think, what humans do. I'm sure there are probably one or two in the world that did that. But I expect many more of you watch for an example to see how it worked out in your friends. In your Christian friends, that is. I wanted to see what Jesus looked like through them. I know I did that as well. And those friends, like Thomas, were keen to tell me about Jesus. After all, it's the basis of their faith and it's the basis of their life. As Romans 10.14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? But that's a sermon for another day. But it's a lifetime for Thomas, once he has put his doubts behind him. And it's a lifetime for us too. Amen. Our next song is I Will Worship, which is a very appropriate response once you have recognised that Jesus is my Lord and my God. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Pete, for your always encouraging words. We now have our opportunity to proclaim our faith in our Lord and our God. If you are able to and would like to, please stand. So let us declare our faith together. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now Liz will lead us in our intercessions. Let us pray. As we enter praying, prayer now, let's pause and gather our thoughts. Father, we come to you with thankfulness for who we are in your sight. Whatever we are feeling like, like whatever our doubts and worries, remind us that we can talk to you and that you have promised that you listen to all who pray in faith. And so we come before you now, Father, bringing our requests, our concerns to you. So, Father, we pray this morning for our world, your world. We ask for your guidance for all world leaders at this time. Help them to seek peace. We especially lift Ukraine to you and ask for wisdom as we pray for that country. This is a prayer for Ukraine from the Methodist Church. Holy and gracious God, we pray for the people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and their leaders. We pray for all those who are afraid that your everlasting arms hold them in this time of great fear. We pray for all those people who have the power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our swords into plowshares and seek for peace. We pray for leaders on the world stage, that they are inspired by the wisdom and courage of Christ. And above all, Lord, today we pray for peace for Ukraine, and we ask this in the name of your blessed Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray today for the United States of America as that nation prepares to celebrate Independence Day tomorrow. We ask for your blessing on all those who truly know you in their lives, so that they may be witnesses for your truth, your justice and your compassion. We pray for the leaders of all nations, national, regional and local, 
that you would guide them to make wise, godly and unselfish decisions that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and honesty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, the earth is yours and everything in it. Please forgive us when we have forgotten that. And please, Lord, continue to show us how we can be thoughtful in our own actions, in our day-to-day -day lives. And we ask for guidance for all our leaders in all the decisions made to work towards reducing our carbon footprint and how to deal with resistance to that goal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are badly affected by the rise in the cost of living, for those now sinking into poverty and for the pressure on food banks. Father, guide our leaders through this and show us what we can do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church, your church. We lift our own congregation to you and we pray for our new church wardens, Chris Davis and Jennifer Anderson, who were sworn in at St Martin's Basildon this week. Surround them with your love and strength and help us to support them in whatever ways we can. We give you heartfelt thanks for Val Shepherd, who has now retired from being warden after six years of faithful service to this congregation. And we also pray for Les, Chris and Margaret as they prepare the applications for funding to grant-making trusts for our roof repairs, with the many, many meetings involved and work involved with this. We ask for your blessing on all our clergy at this time. Strengthen them, lead them, and give them peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are sad because someone they know and love has died. And we pray especially for the family and friends of Susan O'Connor next week um, <clears throat> as they prepare for her funeral. We ask that you uphold and comfort them and let them know your presence with them. And we pray for all those who are ill. And in a quiet moment, we lift up to you others known to us who are bereaved or ill. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, help us to remember your gracious, undeserved love to us. Help us to trust in your unfailing love, knowing that you are the eternal God throughout heaven and earth, and yet God with us, who walks with us through everything. Meet us and reassure us when we have doubts, so that like Thomas, we can say, my Lord and my God. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. May we bring our prayers and praises together and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we, forgive those, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the collect for Thomas the Apostle. Almighty and eternal God, who, for the firmer foundation of our faith, allowed your holy apostle, Thomas, to doubt the resurrection of your son till word and sight convinced him. Grant to us, who have not seen, that we may also believe and so confess Christ as our Lord and our God, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. We now have our final song, an opportunity to pray for and bless one another in the words of the Irish Blessing.
go mani and cheerna hu, agus go goody she hu. The Lord met the left of his face, and the goodness of his heart to be brecht upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Facă să lumineze fața lui peste As we come to the end of our service, just a reminder to pay your sponsorship money to our various walkers. And a reminder also that if you do need anything during the week, please contact the church office and all the details that you need are on the screen at the end of the service. So our closing prayer. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go out and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.